This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by the Avram Davidson Universe, a new podcast devoted to the works of acclaimed fantasy and science fiction author Avram Davidson. Davidson, winner of the Hugo Award, the Edgar Award, and three-time winner of the World Fantasy Award, has been called the greatest American short story writer of the 20th century by Michael Swanwick. Avram Davidson was born 100 years ago this April, and to celebrate, many of his works are being brought back into print, including the Avram Davidson Treasury, Lime Killer, and The Boss in the Wall. Join the Avram Davidson Fan Club at avramdavidson.com to be eligible for free giveaways. And don't miss the Avram Davidson Universe podcast, which includes interviews with guests such as Robert Silverberg, Gregory Benford, and Eileen Gunn. The April 1st episode will feature a powerful never-before-published Davidson story, available only on the podcast. Neil Gaiman writes, If you love fantasy, if you love alternate worlds, or if you just love stories well told, that's who Avram Davidson is. Someone who knows a great deal more than you do, and is damned if both of you aren't going to have a good time. So again, the podcast is called the Avram Davidson Universe, and you can sign up for the Avram Davidson Fan Club over at avramdavidson.com. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 539 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me Please and Other Stories, which is available now on Amazon.com. We had a great conversation about the book back in episode 500, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And today on the show, we'll be discussing season one of the HBO series The Last of Us, based on the popular video game from Naughty Dog. And this will involve spoilers for everything in the show, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Erin Lindsay, making her 36th appearance on the show. She's the author of the Bloodbound series of epic fantasy novels, and the Rose Gallagher series of paranormal historical mystery novels. Her latest Rose Gallagher book, The Silver Shooter, is out now. So, Erin, welcome to the show. Great to be back. The next up, we've got Teresa DeLucci, making her 16th appearance on the show. She reviews books, TV, and video games for Den of Geek and Tor.com, and her reviews of the season premiere and season finale of The Last of Us recently appeared on Tor.com. Her short fiction appears in Strange Horizons, Weird Horror, and Lightspeed, and was given an honorable mention in Ellen Dowdlow's Year's Best Horror, Volume 14. So, Teresa, welcome to the show. So glad to be back here for this one. <laughs> and also joining us today is Zach Chapman, making his 14th appearance on the show. His short fiction appears in Nature, Starship Sofa, Tales to Terrify, Steampunk Universe, and Writers of the Future. And he also edited the book Time Travel Tales, which includes stories by Catherine Wells, Sean Williams, and Robert Silverberg. His retro horror comic House of Blood Volume 1 is available now on Kickstarter. So, Zach, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be back. Okay, so let's start off with Aaron and have you tell us about your expectations going into The Last of Us. <laughs> um, my expectations were complicated. On the one hand, um, I found myself pretty skeptical that this show would have anything new to say that hadn't already been said a million times over, especially with The Walking Dead going on for as long as it has. Um, on the other hand, it was filmed in my hometown, so I was really rooting for it. Um, and very curious to see how the sets that I'd driven past so many times were going to appear in the show. Um, and overall, I, I was pleasantly surprised. I think... Overall, it was a strong show, and I'm glad that it's been renewed for season two. So so what is your hometown? Calgary, Alberta. It was filmed all over the province, but uh, a lot of the filming was done here, including one very noisy night of a shootout that we listened to in the backyard. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. So you, you'd actually, scre heard, screeching you actually tires. heard the, shoot, the, the shooting, the, the, uh, the, sh the show shooting. Uh, the faux shooting, on. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And and recognized a lot of the locations. Um, and it was very cool to see how they had been transformed, not only physically, but digitally. 
There's a lot of CGI, of course, involved in in some of those shots. But it always gives me the warm fuzzies. People, uh, there's a lot of filming in this province because of the mountains uh, and the old west kind of vibe, and it's it always gives me warm fuzzies seeing those very familiar locations. So, could you give an example of like a a location that you have driven by a lot or something that appears in the show? I mean, so many. I some of it was actually filmed in my neighborhood, which is also not unusual. My neighborhood is popular on television. Um, Inglewood uh, was, which was also most recently, I think, in Fargo. But um, I think the the most recognizable location one is not very interesting. It's the Fourth Avenue flyover, which is this elevated freeway through the downtown, um, which was really interesting to see how convincingly they made it look dilapidated and non-functioning. Um, but Canmore, which is about an hour from here and is just nestled right in the mountains, is just really that picturesque in real life. That was the stand-in for Jackson, Wyoming. Um, and just, yeah, just beautiful highways that I've driven down and things like that. Yeah, that's cool. So did you have any knowledge of the game? I was aware of it. Um, but I don't PlayStation, <laughs> so I've never actually I've never actually played it, which is too bad because it sounds like exactly the type of of game I go in for. I like I like the games with the tough moral choices. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good that we have someone on the panel who you didn't know like how the story was going to go or and or not at all. Like that yeah no. All right, cool. Yes, I'll be curious to hear more about that as we go on. So, how about Teresa? What were your expectations going into The Last of Us? Sky high. Hmm. I, I I am a super fan. I've been playing this game since uh, the beta in 2013. Like right before it came out, I went to PAX Prime and got to go see an early preview of the game. And I still have my t-shirt and my poster. Um, I've cosplayed as Ellie before with my <laughs> husband oh, wow. who played Joel. He's much taller than me and has a good beard. And I've written about it and replayed this game over and over. So, yeah, I had some pretty sky high expectations. They had been talking about making this for a while and, you know, it didn't happen. And I don't know, just all the hype. It it worked on me. It got me excited. Um, I have a lot of opinions about this. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, that's super cool. So how many times do you think you've played through the game? Um, I played the first game probably all the way through, probably about three times. It's a short game, the first one. The second one I've played twice. Um, It's a much longer game and very different in its own way. But yeah, there are certain levels that I played multiple times just because they were that fun, like the whole winter chapter. That's one of my favorite gaming sections ever. Last of Us is probably my second game franchise second favorite gaming franchise after Red Dead. And they're both really similar in their ways. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah, I've also, I'm like like Aaron, I don't play Station. So I've never actually played The Last of Us, but I had watched walkthroughs of the whole game, this one and, and part two on YouTube. So I, I kind of knew the story and I, I knew what the gameplay was like. Um, although it was a long time ago, it seems like that I watched the first one. So there was a lot that I didn't remember. Um, but I did, I did remember the ending really, uh, really clearly. So, so I did kind of know, and I thought it was brilliant. I mean, I thought the story was so good when I watched the, the game. So I, I assumed that, you know, that the show would be good. You know, they, all they really have to do is, uh, is stick to the game and, and it was bound to be good. Um, but so how about Zach, what is your, uh, what were your expectations going into the show? Um, I tried not to fall into like, Uh, I didn't want to build the hype up for myself because I am also uh, a fan of this game. Uh, I haven't played the second one, but I played the first one back, you know, 10 years ago now. Um, Actually, also played the beta. uh, And (laughs) I know this this might be a hot take, but I loved the multiplayer they had this multiplayer called Factions. Oh, where yeah. You played as Fireflies. And, and it was actually pretty freaking cool. Like, you, it, it was kind of like Gears of War in that you had, like, a certain amount of stock, like, lives. And it was, uh, it was, it was good. Um, a lot of, like, one-hit kill weapons, from what I remember. A lot of, like, scrounging around in, like, really tense moments. But, um, 
I, I remember I was playing with a friend of mine that was just really good at shooters. And so like, I just got to be carried the whole time. Cause it was like in beta. So we were just <laughs> going to town. And then, then I played the game, like the proper game, the narrative. And, and it's like, I mean, it, it is a perfect game. It's, you know, it's a flagship prestige Sony AAA game. That's like, I don't know if it, if we're going to get into that, but it's like a action stealth that blends strategy and shooting and survival resource management. And it's like, const, it's like constantly stressful to play. Cause you're like trying to balance how much of what you have versus how much your health is. Um, and it's really, it's just a really great game and the way it blends its gameplay with the narrative elements that the, the narrative is like, obviously the show is in most episodes, a shot for shot or in many episodes, a, sh- a shot for shot remake. I mean, it's the script is almost exactly the same, um, but you're just, you don't get the gameplay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you told me Zach that you were going to try to replay the game before we recorded this panel. Did you get a chance to do that? No, I didn't. So I, uh, I don't have a PS3 and I know I was like, oh, it's on Steam, right? Actually, it's not on Steam. I, I like was starting to order it and everything. And it's like, your 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 game will be delivered on March 28th. And I was like, what? We're recording, you know, we're recording <laughs> before that. So it's actually, it is going to be out on Steam slash PC. And this game has come out multiple times. It's, I think it's like, this is this will be the fourth time it's come out. Like the original, and yeah. then a year later it was remastered, and then it was I believe it was remastered again for the PS5. It came out on the PS3, and yeah, I and just four, replayed it on five. the PS5. Oh, nice! And and uh, the they like updated the character models to be a little bit different, right? Yeah, they they made Tess look even more age appropriate for Joel. I loved it. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, I'm I'm looking forward so that, to playing that <laughs> again. Yeah. So so Teresa, is there anything else to say about when you you said you just replayed the game just just before recording this? I or? did. Yeah, you know, I because I hadn't played the remaster for the PS5. I'm spoiled. I have a PS5, and I wanted to see the new character models. I started playing the old remaster and then like wait there's yet another one let me do that and was completely blown away by how good the graphics are um i was playing it for a little bit i'm really rusty at it especially after playing part two more recently which had different controls and then i just kind of stopped because i felt like the show is so much of a one-to-one where i'm like i really i think i kind of have all of these cutscenes kind of memorized. Hmm. I don't I don't think I need to do this right now. So I was am I I was just doing a little research before we uh, got on the call here and am I correct in saying that they released an expansion pack at some point for Ellie's backstory and that the yes. Ellie's backstory in the show is from this expansion pack? Yes. Yes, uh Left Behind that came out in 2014, I believe, and that was all what we saw in episode 7 which was also called Left Behind. And have, and have you remember, played that? Is that yes. I, oh, yeah. I remember it being like really short. Like you could play in less than a day. Like in one, I beat it in one oh, yeah. sitting. And it's not really, mm-hmm. there's not a ton of action. No, I mean, it's just Ellie on her own. Again, you're playing as Ellie in, in the expansion, uh, the DLC and she's going through a mall looking for antibiotics while some of David's group are looking for her. And she's flashing back, remembering the last time she was in a mall with her best friend, Riley, and it played out exactly how you saw it play out on the show. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because I, you know, uh, I thought I had watched the whole game and then those flashback things, I was like, I don't remember this at all. So... So that's interesting that it was from the DLC. Um, okay, but so so getting back to Aaron, so you're going into the show, you have really no idea what the story is going to be or expectations particularly. So what were your uh, impressions of the first two episodes? So like before we get to the Bill and Frank storyline, uh, what was your impression of the show at that point? 
My impression, particularly after episode one, was that that there weren't all that many surprises um, because I haven't played the game, but I'm very familiar with the genre. Um, and I continue to watch The Walking Dead for reasons that have escaped me for at least six years. Um, <laughs> and so I felt like I'd seen a lot of these plot beats before. Um, I would say that episode one was really well executed but did not deviate in any way from those expectations. It was fairly familiar plot beats in terms of, of outbreak. Um, you know, I, I had the usual questions like, how does it all happen so fast? Um, implausibly fast, I still think. Uh, and they addressed the attempt to address that a little bit in episode two, but, but I, I'm a big fan. And I think I've mentioned it on the show before. I try not to judge a show after the first couple of episodes, because there is so much of that, establishing the relationship with the viewer um, that, you know, so I, I sort of reserve judgment after episodes one and two. And I thought this is well executed, but nothing particularly surprising has happened to me to, from my perspective yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, so what happens in the first episode basically is that there's this uh, fungal outbreak called cordyceps that is spread by uh, among other things, maybe tainted flour that gets shipped all around the globe. And so uh, people start turning into zombies, basically, and uh, becoming mindlessly aggressive and eventually sprouting kind of mushrooms out of their heads and stuff like that. Um, so and you, it goes so you down within hours. So you didn't the, think this, that... Sorry, that, that was that You didn't think that was plausible, that the flour gets shipped all over the world and so everybody's eating it and so the outbreak happens globally... Um, I think overnight. I think that part is plausible. I think the time frame is is implausible, bordering on ridiculous. Everybody eats this flour within the same forty eight hour period, and everything starts to go to shit. Um, it it just it, you would see some kind of staggered timeline. I think depending on the origin of of this flour and and where it gets to supermarket shelves the soonest, and all this kind of stuff. It just it happens so fast. Um, and what's interesting about that, where where I think this this show and this story is um, a, a step up from The Walking Dead is, um, I mean, in many ways, but but the first one that occurred to me is that you see by episode two that these vestigial institutions still exist um, in whatever sort of mangled fascist form. We sort of recognize recognize life in the QZ. And these things were there. There is some authority established. There's still running water in some places. There's still electricity in some places. An endless supply of ammunition for some reason. Um, and, and that, to me, is incompatible with the timeline they put forward. Um, I think if you've witnessed crises break out in the world, you know that even the most prepared military or or uh, federal disaster authority in the world does not set up with the snap of a finger. Um, and so there, the, these are little glitches that you sort of have to suspend your disbelief, but but I did trip over them. Hmm. I mean, one thing I thought was funny is that the first episode, there's lots of, at this point, you don't know about the tainted flower. And there's all these moments where Joel, our main character is Joel and his daughter, Sarah, uh, almost eat something containing the flower, but narrowly avoid it. And, and know, I actually kind of noticed that. Your, you did the first time through, you noticed that? I noticed it, but I couldn't put the, my finger on the significance of what it was. By the third or fourth time that they'd done it, I I started to notice it and it didn't, it, but the significance, of course, didn't ping until they have the conversation later. And I was like, aha, it's the flower. But but it looked, I, it's, it looked to me like some kind of running gag that I couldn't put the significance together for. And now I feel stupid looking back. <laughs> Hmm. Um, well, so how about Teresa? Kind of what were your uh, initial impressions of the show? Uh, well, the first episode in particular, the opening, I mean, that's what really made me fall in love with The Last of Us. The first time I played it, you start off playing as Sarah waking up alone in her house at like one in the morning after, you know, you get that little cut scene where it's her dad's birthday and she gives him the watch and they make a joke about like, now you could start paying for the mortgage. You get a sense of what the family's like. And then you wake up as Sarah in her bedroom as in the distance, Austin is starting to blow up. The news is, you know, all these breaking 
alerts and everything, and you feel really vulnerable and scared. And I thought it was really wonderful the way they did it for the show. The opportunity to translate it for TV is putting that whole beginning section in Sarah's point of view instead of Joel's. So you're really getting to spend time with her. And I think it's really setting up in a beautiful way, just knowing that we are going, for me as a game player, knowing we're going to meet Ellie soon, setting up Sarah and what kind of teen girl she is and what kind of protagonist she would make in a game versus the Ellie that we get later after the fall of humanity, after all of this stuff has happened. But when you're first playing and you're first in Sarah's shoes and Sarah's point of view, oh, it was so tense the vulnerability of her, how scared she was, and watching it in 2023 is a lot different than having played it in 2013 when COVID was not a glimmer in our eye. You know, that that falling apart of everything around you felt a lot more intense watching it on the HBO show than it did even in the game because of, you know, how we all might feel about pandemic narratives now yeah so it's so at this point these first two episodes you're totally on board you don't have any problems with how they're adapting the story or anything uh no i mean effort if anything i might have had a little bit of a casting like mm, when pedro pascal was cast as joel because i'm like really is does he have to play every single <laughs> found father dad ever you know and in my head i guess i I had pictured, you know, I don't almost actually almost Jeffrey Dean Morgan, which I knew, you know, <laughs> he plays Megan. Controversy. On the Dead. <laughs> yeah, which he, he couldn't go back there again. But in 2013, when I first played the game and didn't really know about Negan or anything, he seemed like a great fit. But um, well, there, there was oh, there was a thing I saw on Twitter where it said it was it said something like by you know 2030, 90 percent of TV characters will be Pedro Pascal escorting a special <laughs> child. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I'm not be saying okay much. With that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would be okay with that. He he won me over. Um, before the first episode was done, it's really clear he brought his own. Um, nuance to the character, but also really was informed by what Troy Baker, the voice and motion capture actor in the game, who played Joel. Um, so many of his mannerisms, expressions were, oh my God, spot on. I was like, you really are making us so happy. I feel so bad for Witcher fans right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Pet yeah, no, I do feel bad because I never got that from Henry Cavill. I actually stopped watching two episodes in because it was like, this is just not doing anything for me. Um, cause I'm a huge Witcher fan. <laughs> uh, but, but Pedro Pascal, I think part of it is that I'm pretty sure he's, he grew up in San Antonio. I don't think he was born there, but yes. he, so he has that kind of, he's, he sounds like, like. When uh, my wife and I were looking up like accents and things, it was like, we don't think Pedro Pascal has an accent. It's like, well, yeah, because he, he he sounds like us. He sounds like the, the people that, you know, I grew up around. So um, I think his that's like, so funny, Zach. <laughs> his, he definitely his, has an accent. <laughs> yeah, but but like <laughs> yeah. but I, I don't like my wife and I don't hear it because like that's just what we've always heard growing up you know it's so it's like oh you know when you you don't think your own accent is an accent i guess is or your your ear doesn't but um but i do think that um the original actor um sorry I, i'm blanking on his name the voice troy actor. baker Tro troy baker and he's he's in it he's in the show but he um he does have more of a southern twang like from like more like a West Texas kind of vibe than Pedro Pascal. At least that's kind of what, how I felt, but I do think he's amazing for the role. And, and yes, Pedro Pascal will be the father of everyone in 
old <laughs> new content. His shoulders well, must be so tired from carrying <laughs> HBO and Disney Plus all on his back. Spe- just speaking of uh, accents, you know, I went and watched some interviews with uh, Bella Ramsey, who plays. Isn't Bella she Kelly. amazing? <laughs> wow, and she's yeah. she has this really you know strong British accent, and you would I, never, I never know. would have never, yeah, never know. I I, I knew because I'd saw seen her in Game of Thrones. And she, she has the, you know, the, as if memory serves, the Yorkshire accent, certainly a British accent yeah. <laughs> in Game of Thrones. And I was like, am I crazy? Which one of these is she nailing? <laughs> um, yeah, she's, I mean, she's incredible in every way, but the accent is is really uh, exceptional. Yeah. So let me just explain. So what happens basically in the plot is that, yeah, the this um, fungal outbreak starts infecting people, turning them into zombies and society quickly collapses and uh, Joel is trying to protect his daughter Sarah, but she's killed by uh, you know, by by the military basically. And then we pick up twenty years later uh, when he's living in this. Uh, it's called the QZ, the quarantine zone. This sort of you know area under kind of uh, martial law and you know military control. And he's a smuggler. Um, and uh, this uh, girl Ellie. He's he's sort of given a job to to take this uh, girl Ellie somewhere um, to to bring her to this group called the Fireflies, which is sort of the uh, resistance. And he finds out fairly quickly that she's a, the special child that she's immune to the um, to the fungal infection, and so p- potentially could be studied by doctors to formulate some sort of cure or vaccine or something. Um, so that's kind of what happens in those first two episodes. So, so Zach, say you want to say more about kind of what were your expe- uh, your um, reactions to those first two episodes, and also in comparison to to the game. So, uh, I think what worked so well about the first episode is just what works very well in the game. It's very tight, especially when the um, when the night happens and the outbreak, the the spur of the outbreak. Um, it's it's really strong. I think by the second episode, um, it definitely tapers off. And that's when I would think that there would be less of a one-to-one adaptation because there's kind of some more maybe gameplay elements like traversal, um, which in episode two, there's some fights against... Really, there. I think episode two might be the only um, episodes where Ellie and Joel are fighting against the infected. I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but um, there's, well, and that's where. There's the part where they all come out of the ground. Are you counting that? Yes. And also when they're in the building and um, they, uh, Joel has to fight multiple, there's only two or three in the building and it's it is where um Tari, uh um Tess ends up getting bit in that segment um but i was not super into that part in the show i i felt like when you're when you're playing a game you're like ro- you're like role playing and you're really into it and you have to strategize how you are going to go about taking out these monsters. And usually you're doing it like in a quiet way. And um, like a lot of the, of the game is you're, you're strategizing, like using improvised weapons that you're picking up and, and creating like bricks. You pick like a brick up from the corner of a building and like bash one of their heads in. And there was no examples of Pedro Pascal doing that in the show that like made him seem crafty or like felt gamey. Like all of the lame parts of the game were captured. Like, Hey, move, you know, you got to climb up this thing or do some like kind of boring puzzle (laughs) element there, but not like the brutal, like smash someone in the face multiple times with a brick or stab them with a shiv that doesn't happen in the show. And I think at least for me, it dropped the ball a little bit. No, I think that's a good. I mean, because the the gameplay is really brutal. I mean, all the moves you can do and stuff uh, more so than the show. So yeah, maybe they could have 
done that more. I mean, I, I personally found this stuff really tense. I found those first two episodes almost unbearably tense to watch. And like Aaron, I, going in, I was a little worried. Like I've watched so many zombie things. I was afraid I was just kind of like inured to the to the yeah. zombie genre and, at this point. But and, yeah. and to that point, I think I don't think it was a mistake to maybe um, not go full throttle on some of the brutality for a few different reasons. One, just from a storytelling perspective, if you start with the volume at 10, you don't have any place to go. Um, well, but two, <laughs> all right, spinal tap. <laughs> um, but two, I think it's if, if you want to go in for like just the pure gore and awful brutality, The Walking Dead, that that is the thing that they do over and over and over again to the point where it almost exactly. becomes comical. It, it, you just get so inured to it and it's just so so I actually don't think that that was a mistake it was one of the things that I preferred about this show is they really focus more on the on the human drama not just human awfulness which the walking dead is obsessed with but but human drama in all its totality uh Teresa what do you think about this as a compared to other zombie um movies oh, and yeah, shows ab- and stuff? absolutely you know I've watched all 11 seasons of The Walking Dead. Well, most of all 11 seasons of The Walking Dead. And it is like relentlessly reminding you how shitty humans could be. We get it. And I think Craig Mazin, who's one of the showrunners with Neil Druckmann, who created the game, are really aware of 11 years of The Walking Dead and its 5 million spinoffs now coming of they know that we know that people could be shitty, but here's a story where things are shitty, but also hopeful and loving and humorous and complicated. And not everybody you meet is going to be an absolute shitheel looking to fuck you over. You might make some friends. You might fall in love. You might find a family. And I think that's what makes people like this show a lot and come and, back and when to it, it comes and to, not feel like it's a walking dead retread. And when it comes to glistening innards and, and faces being bashed in with bricks, less is more. No, I, 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 I want to be it's a little really, bit more. It, it's really effective clarify, when you, when you hold sure, back a little on that stuff. I, I would like to clarify a little bit. My point is that not that it needed more brutality. My point is that it needed to capture what made the game so cool, which is not the brutality It's the tenseness of needing to choose between, well, do I sacrifice a little bit of my health here? Because like I, I like literally the only thing that I have is a brick or do I use the ammo? Like there are these tough choices that you have to make as a game player that to me are not reflective or not pushed in an interesting way into the show. And I know when you're making an adaptation and this is this is a one to one of all of the cinematic stuff that but that's where the game far surpasses the show in that it mingles those things like you're constantly having to make these choices of like do i do i go this extra long route and scavenge for things and possibly get in myself into situations that are much worse Than if I had just taken the shortcut and kept my ammo low and, you know, I have an extra shiv or whatever. I didn't break my shiv. So those types of things are like, that's what I want to see. It's the it's the cleverness of the characters that you're missing, not so much the gore. Yeah, I think you sound like a much more um, organized gamer than me. (laughs) I think I just kind of. Leroy Jenkins it in there and <laughs> just go hog wild. Although I will say The Last of Us is one of the games that really pushed me towards buying my own bow. Um, I really love all of the stealth in the games. And I'm like, this looks like a hell of a lot of fun. So in the pandemic, me and my dad both got bows and started shooting in the yard. And, awesome. and it is as fun as it looks. Yeah. It's, it's, well, you guys are making me want to play this game even more because I totally go in for the stealthy assassinations. That's my jams. Yeah. Well, I'm never the warrior. Stealthy. I'm always the rogue. I wonder, is is this show a little too short? I mean, it's nine episodes long. Yes. And maybe should it have been 10 or 11 or 12 yes. or something? They could have included more, more, more of these things. 
emphatically, yes, I would have liked to have seen, you know, I could agree with a little bit more of that. I thought we'd get a little fan service of Pedro, like throwing a brick. No brick. He did at all. No brick. I didn't see any brick, (laughs) but I did see, you know, (laughs) nope. But I did see to your point in, in the season finale, Ellie did get a boost up and lower that ladder and we got the over the shoulder POV camera shot that was like one to one from the video game. You know, again, I you know, when we get to the finale, I have some feelings about yeah. that, but I would have liked to have spent a little more time with Tess. You know, she was not around as long as I would have thought based on her import to the game. I would have liked a little more. And there were a few spots throughout the season that I felt could have been two episodes. Yeah. Do you think that was I, just I a budget a budget better. thing that they just had? A certain budget and they only had... I'm not sure if it's because they made the first episode so long. They're like, we don't want to do 10. I, w- I would have done 10. I-, I don't think HBO spared a single cent on this, on the on the production, on the marketing. This shit was everywhere. I went. I went to an early screening of at a theater here in New York City that they completely redressed to look like the New York QZ with actors and zombies. And it was crazy. You could tell they're doing the Game of Thrones treatment for this. They knew what they had when they picked this up. And I think Zach's point is is a good one in that I think there were definitely some moments where I recall them making the decisions about which way to go and do they take the shorter, riskier route or the longer route. bringing its own set of risks rude and things like that. But one thing to go back to the thing I said before that I am a little questioning of, um, and that I think maybe the walking dead does better is this, this issue of, of resource scarcity. Uh, They have this endless supply of ammunition. Um, They have things like just the batteries for your flashlights. Where are these coming from? How are they, how are they still in circulation as prominently and as easily as they are? And it sits a little bit awkwardly with the narrative of Joel being a smuggler. Like they, they imply this resource scarcity exists. Um, that's his whole raison d'etre, but they don't really show it. And so it would definitely have been effective if you have those moments where they literally have nothing and have to make do with what they have, whether that's an improvised weapon or an improvised shelter or an improvised whatever. Um, And they do that a lot in The Walking Dead. Those guys, like every arrow counts, everything that might be used as a blade is pocketed. And I think we could get a little bit more of that in this. Why don't we talk about for people who haven't played the game, are there, like we're saying that it's sort of a, um, it follows the plot, that the show follows the plot of the game very closely. Are there any major divergences from the game that kind of jump out to anyone? (laughs) Episode three is definitely yeah, absolutely. episode three. It's definitely uh, completely an aside that's different. And it, it could be my favorite episode probably for those reasons in that some adaptations Hands down. like benefit from just leaving the source material and saying, okay, like that's great as it is, but we need to like fit our medium. Like we need to fit what, uh, you know, the the format of a television show. And I think episode three works really strongly for that because the um, that's all backstory that's mostly implied. The whole episode of uh, Bill and um, maybe is it Perry, like falling in love? Frank. Um, Frank. That's, that's Frank. all just implied in a couple of sentences and like a throwaway joke in the game. But so you don't see any of that stuff from what I recall. It has been quite a few years, but yeah. Yeah. Let me just, let me just explain. So, so in the show, um, Joel and Ellie are going to like along their route. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to get West across the country and along their route, they're going to stop at Bill and Frank's house. And we don't at that point know anything about Bill and Frank. And so then we, we sort of flash back to the day of the outbreak and we meet Bill, who's this survivalist who's hiding in his basement when the military comes to round everybody up. And then he sort of tricks out his, you know, his block with the uh, fences and traps. <laughs> and and he's living a pretty comfortable life uh, all by himself. And then um, there's this other guy, um, Frank, who 
um, falls into one of his traps. He has a, a hole in his in his yard, sort mm -hmm. of, and and so then, and he's initially suspicious of suspicious of him, but eventually they fall in love, and they and so we 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 track the course of their relationship over over the next twenty years, I guess, um, and eventually uh, Joel, you know, from before the story from the present of the story starts, shows up. And so the stories connect. And then at the end, um, Joel and Ellie show up at the at Bill and Frank's house. But by this point, Bill and Frank have, have chosen to take their own lives together. And so they don't actually appear in the present um, of the story. Whereas in the game, I think Bill does appear, right, as a character in the right. present yeah. of the story. Right. Um, um, in, so the, in the game, it was... It ended a lot different. Again, like Zach was saying, it was a little bit of a throwaway. But in the game, uh, Frank had kind of left Bill and said, you are too isolationist. And, you know, I I'm tired of just being trapped here, isolated with you. I need to get out. And he went and killed himself. And Joel and Ellie found his body in the note later. Bill had no idea you know, that that's kind of what happened to Frank. So very, very different from what was on the show and so much better on the show, so much more thematically appropriate. Yeah, and I ended up, I mean, I was a little nervous when that episode started because, you know, we'd had such a tense first two episodes and I felt like the tension pretty much evaporated in this third episode. And I wasn't sure, like, I was going to like it. Um, but, I, you know, I ended up, you know, you know, really liking it. And probably when I think back on the show, it's one of the things that's going to stand out most in my mind. But it was like definitely a choice to have this episode long flashback to a pretty minor character, three episodes into a season. And I can't think of any other show off the top of my head that that went into such a big flashback for such a minor character um, so early in the season. Um, so I, I'm curious what people think about that. But so but Aaron, you said this was your favorite episode of the of the season. I, I loved it. Um, I It had some tension for me at the beginning, I think because I'm a veteran of watching The Walking Dead. And so I kept waiting for Frank to be <laughs> a murderous shitbag. <laughs> and so, you know, it, that scene where, where Bill sits down at the piano and starts to play, I'm like, don't let him stand behind you. <laughs> like, I just was sure that this was all going to go terribly wrong. Um and also just because of White Lotus, I didn't totally trust Murray Bartlett, who's <laughs> amazing. Um, but anyway, I loved this episode, everything about it. I loved, I mean, the performances from both actors were just, Nick Offerman was amazing. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought he had those chops, but he, but he does. Uh, Murray Bart Bartlett was obviously amazing and just the dynamic between them. Um, I loved the whole, there was some grumbling I saw online about, you know, that th this was, this episode didn't have anything to do with the rest of the story arc. And so it was just, you know, it was a throwaway to inclusion. And I just rolled my eyes for so many reasons. The big one being, boy, did you miss the point? This, yeah. this relationship, this episode would not have worked nearly as well with a straight couple. Part of what makes it so affecting is that it literally takes the apocalypse for Bill to accept who he is and to think that he can find love. And that, and that's just so dramatic. Um, but I, I think what I like best about this episode, it almost had the feel of fan fiction where you have mm. a short story that's linked to the world that takes place in the universe, but doesn't really directly impact on the main narrative. But what it does is it enriches the world so much. It shows us what's at stake and reminds us that our two lonely protagonists aren't the center of the universe, that they're the center of our universe and that they're the center of this narrative. But it reminds us like why this, why this quest to get Ellie across the country to possibly make a cure counts. It reminds us that there are millions of other lives going on in the margins that we'll never get a glimpse of. And so when those big action moments come and people are dropping like flies, we remember to think of them as individuals with their own backstories. And I think a lot of these shows, high action shows and post-apocalyptic shows don't really do a good job of that. Those secondary characters, those NPCs in a very literal <laughs> sense, tend to be very two-dimensional and cutaway. And these guys gave us a fully fleshed out 
story from beginning to end between two fully fleshed out individuals who remind us why what's going on in this world is important. And I just thought it was brilliant. I'm interested in what Zach was saying about how how this sort of um, you know feeds into or reinforces the the whole theme of the show about attachment. And I'm wondering what what do you make of the the parallels or differences between Joel and Bill's journeys? As are they the same or are they different in any way? Um, I don't know, Teresa. Do you want to do you have any thoughts about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think one of the one of the lines that really stuck out with me from Bill is when he says to Frank, um, I was never afraid until you showed up. He wasn't scared of the apocalypse. He wasn't scared of living alone. He was afraid when he had someone he was afraid to lose when he had love for what looked like really the first time in his life, like Aaron was saying, like the first time he was really able to come out and live honestly as who he was when no one was around. And, you know, as much as Bill definitely has a parallel with Joel, you know, Bill's purpose, he tells Frank. And Aaron, I was also with you having watched White Lotus being like, oh my God, I hope Frank is housebroken. Don't let him in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when, you know, Bill says to Frank, like, you're my purpose. And if you're not around, I don't have a purpose. He sees that in Joel too. And that's why he knows when, you know, Frank gets sick. We don't know what disease it is. It looks like maybe like Parkinson, something like that. No cure. He's going to die. And after 20 years, 15 years living together, you know, Bill says, I'm ready to go too. You are my purpose. He sees some of himself like that in Joel. So I think the show very clearly makes a parallel between the two. But I also well, thought he, it was kind of interesting. Oh, sorry. He, he, he straight up states it in his letter to Joel. Yeah. Um, which is so strong in that Joel has, he's thinking of Tess and that that's kind of where he's framing that. Mm -hmm. Joel, you're a protector is basically like, are, we are, we are the men or, or we are the people rather that have to do, that have to make the hard decisions that it takes to protect the ones that we love. And without the ones that we love, like we're just a rabid dog kind of is like kind of the vibe that I got from that. And again, that goes like thematically with the show. So people who are saying, Oh, episode three makes no sense. It's just for inclusion. It's like, it's so thematically building what, what Joel is like who it, it, he, yeah. who he is. And what, foreshadows his choice at the end. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. To those people, I'm like, um, just, there's no, I mean, no, no point in even having a conversation with those people, but, but yeah, yeah. like <laughs> no. they're not going to listen, but it does serve a purpose. It's, it's very important to the plot. And even outside of that, I love it episodically. Like, even if it didn't have to do with Joel's progression, can't you just love some, a lot of this show is super episodic. The, the very beginning is very, the, the game is that way too. There's like cuts in time in the game and in the show where things are, are segmented that feel more episodic instead of, you know, a, uh, a, uh, an, uh, a series one yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, Every, well, well, I think we need to, we're running, <laughs> we have a lot of stuff still to get to and um, <laughs> we we're can. running a little short on time. So actually I want to jump, Aaron just brought up um, uh, Joel's choice at the end and I want to make sure we have enough time to, to do justice to that. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to skip over sort of the middle of the season the, where we the have. The whole rest of the show. <laughs> yeah. Where we have, <laughs> know, well, and maybe, God. maybe we can circle back to it if we have time, but, but we have, you know, the, uh, was it Kansas City and then Kansas, that, David ha Henry yeah, and Sam the the, the, the cult oh, and then the um the resort with where Joel finds Tommy and stuff but so I'm gonna skip over that for the moment and and so yeah so they're all so yeah there's there's all these episodic adventures and people uh you know it seems like things are people are gonna be friends or allies and then something goes wrong or they turn out to be bad or or something and 
Um, but ev- eventually, uh, Joel makes his way to and is reunited with the Fireflies and delivers Ellie into their custody. And it turns out, you know, and this is, you know, all part of their plan to try to find a cure for the uh, cordyceps uh, infection. Um, but then it turns out that in order to uh, potentially manufacture a cure, they're going to have to uh, autopsy Ellie's brain, uh, ki- you know, obviously killing her. And so um, so Joel chooses to basically save Ellie uh, and potentially give up a cure, give up the possibility of a cure for all the rest of the world. So, uh, so Aaron, Mm. uh, having no, um, foreknowledge, what did you think of this, uh, climax to the story? Having no foreknowledge, I wasn't terribly surprised, um, by uh, the, the specifics of the choice were, were, um, obviously not known to me, but I, I wasn't surprised by a choice like this coming um because because i am familiar with the genre and be, you know because i have watched similar shows before i think that type of choice often features um i think it was interesting for for a number of different reasons and sort of shows you the the growth or if growth maybe in certain ways joel's character is coming full circle i think the moral dilemma that it poses is made more interesting by a number of unanswered questions. Like for me, the if it were clear that that Ellie's dissecting Ellie's brain and killing her would lead to a cure and that that cure would be somehow viable, a viable path to ending the apocalypse, that would be a tough choice in and of itself. Um to me <laughs> for for some of the reasons that I've raised earlier, the complete lack of infrastructure makes it to me questionable whether it would have even been a viable path to end in the apocalypse. It's one thing to discover how cells interact with one another. It's quite another to mass produce and distribute a vaccine. To me, at best, they were on a path to producing a small vial of anti-venom that they could use on their own group, judging from the resources they appeared to have at their disposal. And so for me- I mean, just for purposes of the show, let's just stipulate- that say that there was an 80% chance that uh, tens of thousands of people would be cured. Can you uh, stipulate by, that though? By dissecting. <laughs> well, because if I... it's otherwise, there, there's not really a moral dilemma if the cure is not going to work anyway. But I, I think what makes the question interesting is to say maybe there's a strong possibility that this would actually cure the, or, you know, or make a big difference anyway. Uh, Teresa, were yeah, you going mean, to say something? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say the Neil Druckmann, the creator of the game, co-showrunner here, has stated in interviews in the past, like, yeah, you know, in kind of in canon, like this is the show's trolley problem. The cure would have worked. You know, like we're we're operating with the idea that the cure will work. Um they don't go into detail. You know, I kind of agree. Like now in 2023, do I think even half the country would take a vaccine to keep mushrooms from (laughs) sprouting out of their fucking head? No, I don't. But for the sake of the game and the, the moral dilemma at the show, at the show center, you know, we kind of have to operate like how Joel thinks. And yes, like this cure could work. But it's the trolley problem. Do I save all these people I don't know? Or do I save my child? So where I was going with this is I don't know that I buy that it's a trolley problem for reason A, which I just outlined. But even if you take that out of the equation, reason B, and this ties back to the conversation we were just having about episode three, I don't buy that that's the choice that Joel was making. I think his decision to save Ellie is as much a decision to save himself as anything else. I think it was fundamentally a selfish decision, which is why he wasn't open to, for example, letting Ellie wake up and make her own damn choice. Fundamentally, he didn't want to go through the pain a second time. And so what makes Joel's choice problematic, in my opinion, is that he makes the wrong choice for the wrong reason, instead of making the wrong choice for the right reason. So, uh, so Zach, what do you think about that? Is uh, Joel the villain of the story? Um, yeah, so <laughs> this is really interesting, and I'm just going to approach it as the trolley problem, like, proper, that, yeah, 
he would have saved people by sacrificing her. So, or, you know, letting them do the, the biopsy on the brain. So when I was playing the game, you're, you're like groomed as a protector the whole course of the game that you're like protecting this character, you're growing with her. And so I think I was more empathizing with Joel on my playthrough and watching the show, you're not role playing anyone. You're just watching a show. So it's much easier to sit back and to have less of an impact, to be honest, to look at it. Because the last episode is just a one-to-one. It's The script is exactly the same, except for the the uh, cold open on uh, the final episode, which is uh, brings context that I felt was completely unnecessary, but did include the original voice actress playing uh, Ellie's mom. This but is, it, just, yeah. just, to, just to be clear, so this is Ellie's pregnant mother. You, you, we show how... Ellie's mother giving birth to her and how she became yeah. immune to the yeah and cortisone. getting bit and, and and I think that that you know actually fucks up the trolley problem because if you know how then you could if she she knows how it happened so you know with enough resources you could maybe recreate that but uh, aside from that if you just look at it as a trolley problem I feel that like I, I it's hard to empathize empathize with him as it's stated in the show but. Like I said before, when you're playing it and you're like groomed to play this role, you're gut like you're gunning down all of these doctors and like soldiers, and you're like, yeah, I'm saving her. But in the show, it's just like, <laughs> exactly. ah, man, yeah. Uh, and it's also it's like oh, I'm just watching like a, a you know a rerun too, you know. So uh, so yeah, that's my well- take. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you know, I, I, th- I assume, I mean, I haven't followed this super closely, but I assume that people have been arguing about this, you know, Joel's choice here ever since the game came out and yep. uh, that public opinion has not uh, gravitated particularly to either poll, that it's something that keeps people arguing. And to me, I think, I was going to say, I think the reason is that it's kind of a, a classic breakdown between utilitarianism and virtue ethics as to how do you oppose moral quest, how do you uh, approach moral questions? And so from a utilitarian standpoint, the greatest good for the greatest number of people, the choice is clearly to sacrifice Ellie. But from the standpoint of virtue ethics, of what kind of person do we like and admire, the kind of person that we like and admire is the kind of person like Joel who will do anything to rescue someone who is an innocent person who he loves and cares about um, and has come to, to value. And so I think that that's potentially why this is such a naughty problem. Um, but then Aaron's thing is kind of interesting that actually she thinks Joel's motives are kind of shitty <laughs> and selfish. <laughs> so that kind of throws a wrench into that. But, um, but Teresa, what do you, what do you think? Well, I thought it was really interesting the way that they portrayed it. I mean, I feel, you know, a lot of people talking about Pedro Pascal's portrayal of Joel, they've added more for the show where, he is very clearly suffering from PTSD and you feel it in the game too. You feel, you know, this trauma that he's gone through. It's intimated that, you know, he tried to kill himself right after his daughter died and you're with him on the worst night of his life. Uh, But on the show, you know, he's deaf in one ear and he's getting these panic attacks and heart racing. He's really shut down and disassociated. And then he lets those guards down and gets, you know, Ellie gets in there. So what I thought was interesting about the last episode was, you know, he's been lauded as this, you know, not lauded in the show, but lauded in people reviewing the show and responding to Pedro Pascal, like, he's so vulnerable. This is non-toxic masculinity. And then they end it with this shooting spree it looks like a mass shooting event and they're playing the saddest music from the score over it it's it's sad he his eyes are completely cold it's almost in a way like he's regressed to that protector at all cost animal that Tess had hinted at in the in the beginning like oh you think I'm bad like I keep Joel kind of on a leash you know I I'm the Joel whisperer and then when he's going off to get Ellie, 
I, I just thought it was horribly sad in a way. He's shooting people who are have their back turned to him. He's going back to make sure they're dead. It's, method, it's methodical. It's cold. He gets into that room with a doctor. Nobody's armed. He shoots him in cold blood. You know, like right, you know, they're, it's serious. It's, it's not, it doesn't feel rousing and triumphant like it would on the Mandalorian when you're like, oh, shoot all these stormtroopers to save Grogu. Yeah. This is fucking sad. Well, I think one read of this uh, show could very easily be someone who does something that's objectively terrible, but you show it from their point of view and we sympathize with them completely. Yes. Um, And that's interesting. But I I also think it's interesting what Aaron said that, you know, while Joel doesn't wake up Ellie and ask her, allow her to make the choice. But by the end of the, by the last shot, it seems pretty clear to me that Ellie basically knows. We we basically see what choice she would make, which is also the selfish choice um, that she Mm. knows Mm. or at some level knows that he's not, what he's telling her is not true. And we see the choice that she makes, which is that she wants to live. Um, and so kind of chooses to mm-hmm. no, no, I'm not sure, not sure I buy that. I think what we no, see is, is Ellie struggling to tell herself to, that she believes it because she, she needs to believe it to be true because if it's not true, then everything is even more horrible. Now, not only has view. she not fulfilled her purpose and everything that yeah. she's gone through has been for nothing. And all of these people, some of whom she knows and maybe even cares about are dead. Now she can't trust Joel and Joel's a monster. She's not going to swallow yeah. that pill if she can help it. So she is willfully tamping down her doubts is what I saw in that last shot. Yeah, I don't think she believed his fairy tale at all. And I think she's kind of yeah purposefully in a bit of denial because, you know, she also said that her greatest fear was ending up alone. She told that to Sam, the little boy in Kansas city, you know, Mm -hmm. without Joel, what does she have either? Wait, sorry. Could you clarify what, what do you disagree with about what I, what I said? You think that she doesn't, she's not making a selfish choice or. Oh, I, I think that if she had all that information, I think she would have, okay the fireflies cutting into her brain to work for the cure i i do think she would do that yeah i agree because she want you know she wanted all of this death and loss everybody like you said everybody i've ever loved has either died or left me behind she wants it to mean something she wants to have a purpose what other purpose does she have in this world you know and, to get and joel knows all that too zombie. which is why he didn't mm-hmm. consent to her being able to make her own choice. Right. I mean, Marlene never explicitly um, proposed that they let her wake up, but they do have the conversation where she says, Ellie would want this. And I think, you know, that. So, yeah, wait, but, but the, the last, the last line of the show is Ellie saying, okay. And yeah, like, okay. <laughs> but I just feel like, like that the fact that that's the last line to me makes it seem like, it, it gives it more import than if it wasn't the last line of the entire season. <laughs> that it seems like she's making a choice there. More- I think she's making a choice to... I mean, honestly, I I personally think she knew Joel was lying to her about what he did to get her out of the Firefly Hospital there. And she is crushed and disappointed. And she's like, I know you need me to believe what you're saying because i feel he put a lot of emotional burden on her she's a kid and she knows that joel is kind of his reason to go on fighting and go on living he's like you find something to fight for and keep going ellie knows that she's joel's reason but i don't know that she's entirely comfortable with that knowing that that's what he did um, so, so I want to get Zach back in here, but, but so do we think that there's any possibility that, that Ellie seeks out the fireflies again to sacrifice herself? Like, is that on the table? Um, I, Zach, what do you think about all this? I, uh, I think it's on the table. Um, I think the, the brilliance of at least the script and the way it's framed in that last bit is, you know, we can take 
you can read into it so many ways, like that it's kind of like um, Inception and the the spinning, you know, it <laughs> does she believe him? <laughs> and if she doesn't, is she convincing herself um, because she needs to believe he's not a monster, right? That's that's what I don't mean. That could be what it is, right? But the way it's it's I written mean, is you can and just it's very read into hard. It. And I mean, and there's a whole second game which we're not getting into the spoilers for that here. I'm assuming so. Yeah, I mean, no spoilers some for stuff. Yeah, the second please, game. Yeah. I, I do want to no. play that one. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But I mean, I mean, um, I mean, it seems clear to me that she doesn't believe him i mean why would she ask in the first place right. if she did it right was eating so, at her yeah so so the i guess the question is just like what is her motivation for bringing it up and then saying oh okay i believe you is it i guess is it selfish or is it some other like you guys are saying you think it's some other motivation than, than that she wants to that she doesn't want to sacrifice herself i i think she doesn't want to sacrifice her relationship with joel yeah. And, well, and it she loves him too. It can be both, right? Like I'm sure she's not like rah rah. Let's take out my brain. Um, she 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 can hope that that the path that he's showing her, or that the that the version of the story that he's giving her is true. Um, but I think fundamentally she just can't face it because it puts in play a whole bunch of things that she doesn't want to confront or that she doesn't think she can confront. And, and ultimately what's, you know, what's the point of continuing to question what she will probably, she'll probably never know the truth one way or the other, or at least that's what she assumes as she's standing there on that Hill, what's done is done. So what's the point of blowing up her relationship with Joel and confronting all of these awful realities if it doesn't change what happened? Well, is, is that, yeah, I, I think is, is that, that the, the interpretation that, that that both of them have become so important to the other that that they won't uh give up on the other one no matter what like at any at any price or at any stakes like is that how well, we're I meant think, to read the story i think you know if i if i can i think it's um a lie agreed upon mm -hmm. you know that, that it's it's the giraffe in the room between them <laughs> that they know it's there <laughs> And I, think, I really want to talk you know, about it, those damn giraffes. I have questions. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, you know, I also think all of this is interesting coming after Ellie's encounter with David, the preacher and the camp before that, you know, she, that was a loss of innocence for Ellie in a way. She was always tough, but she really got herself out of that situation. And that was probably the worst thing she's ever been survive through and at the start of the episode it's like you know she's still not there's a distance there she's still in herself processing kind of you know she was almost raped and made into a sister wife and turned into stew meat all within that like the span of a half hour she lost a lot of innocence there and a lot of trust and i think her trauma like she's still kind of processing it and joel is the one who kind of pulled her back from the edge there when he found her after she had taken that machete to David like 22 freaking times. <laughs> so she wants to believe him. She, she like she, she needs him again, but she didn't want to be lied to. All right, I guess I'll just, before we run out of time, I'll just mention really my only problem with the show, and this is very minor, but I'm just curious. I just want to get it, get it out there is that when Ellie first sees the Mortal Kombat 2 machine she's just <laughs> completely exuberant and it's just like oh my god Mortal Kombat 2 what's so awesome there's this character she swallows you whole and like barfs out your bones this is awesome and we find out later that just like a couple days ago her best friend and first crush like died under horrible uh circumstances shortly after they had played Mortal Kombat 2 together for the first time. And it just seems like, it seems, seems odd to me that she wasn't like more, uh, you know, like had a, had a, had a more of a negative reaction when she saw the Mortal Kombat 2 game, given what uh, associations you would think it must have had and fairly fresh ones for her. 
So I, I thought like in some of the early episodes, she was like spunky in a way that didn't totally fit for me once we find out what happened to her just a couple days earlier. Um, but other than that, I, I thought the show was fantastic. But um, I'll just throw that out there. Uh, Aaron's biggest problem apparently was the giraffes. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, just to, to respond to what you just said, I mean, I, I agree that on the face of it, the reactions, some of the reactions are, are not necessarily what you might expect. But I'd also put out there, uh, not being a mental health expert myself, but I'd also put out there that um, trauma is a prism that distorts many things. And I don't think it's entirely possible to predict the reactions of someone who's suffering from trauma. People process trauma and grief in strange ways. Um, But anyway, yeah, but also giraffes in the winter. I just, what are they eating, (laughs) man? Even if they could survive the cold, what are they eating? And I just- Cordyceps. I just (laughs) just love giraffes. I really love them. They're one of my favorite animals, but there's no way. I was just trying, where where was that supposed to be? Was that supposed to be Colorado? Uh, Or or Utah? Somewhere with mountains. Utah, some- yeah, I think it's supposed to be somewhere outside of Salt Lake City. Right. Um, I thought it was fun, like, just knowing that giraffes were coming as I'm watching the show, keeping my eyes peeled for any little <laughs> foreshadowing. Sign and of I giraffes. saw, like, I know, yeah, I saw <laughs> in the Jackson episode when Ellie and Joel have that big conversation where she overheard that he wanted to leave her with Tommy. Mm. Joel is standing right by a poster of a giraffe. Oh. And I'm like, oh. Oh, you clever bastards. You're doing it. <laughs> the the giraffe was my standout what the fuck moment. My standout standout moment is the whole scene, which I don't know why, but I unreasonably hope we circle back to this later. The scene with Graham Greene and the lady from Northern Exposure. I loved oh every inch God. of that scene Holy. and I just wanted more. <laughs> I just wanted more yeah. of those two. They were so which, awesome. Sorry, sorry, which, which, episode. which scene are we talking about? It's where the indigenous the couple. indigenous couple where oh, they come oh. back to the cabin and he's like, "You made them soup." Like, <laughs> holy! Uh, look at the mouth on her. Uh, like, they were so they great. Were great. They thought everything was just fucking hilarious, and they were not the least bit intimidated by by Joel or the or the scrappy teenager with the gun. And I just I loved that whole scene. Hmm. I loved Rutina Wesley as. Tommy's Joel's brother Tommy um his wife his new wife I felt it was vindication after the shitty screenplays she was given in True Blood to have her be here and be able to show that she is in fact a very good actor <laughs> she just needs the right show and bless you Maria and your diva cups I have questions about those too mm-hmm. in the apocalypse but I appreciate that this show was not afraid of showing you know, but girls. Very and practical. There are problems. Yeah. I thought that was really very thoughtful. I think my favorite episode might have been the Jackson episode just because we don't really get to go into Jackson until the second game. So getting to see it earlier than I was expecting, I thought was really, it, it made me feel emotional because that's going to be a big set piece in the next show. Well, I'm okay, sure the people of Canmore would be happy to welcome you into their their own little Jackson. I've been seeing <laughs> on I've been seeing ads from Alberta Tourism Board <laughs> all over my Facebook <laughs> and Instagram, so maybe maybe a trip is in my future. All right, I want to get Zach back in here so Zach just anything else you want to say about this show? Uh, any well, other I want to say want to that the score is perfect and it's perfect because it yes. was I, I've listened to that score for a decade. It's the same score as the game. They, they might have added some stuff, but uh, I've listened to that for a decade now. Uh, like while I write, it is so good and it's very simple. It's just you know guitar and it's not like a full. It's it's not like a full uh, you know symphony like playing band it's it's like a really intimate quiet um it's it's actually kind of similar in a lot of ways to like a red dead game um uh, yeah but yeah uh yeah i just i, I love yep. the music this um and i was gonna say yeah there was a couple episodes i want to touch on i think it's like episode six or seven where um the one where joel gets injured um is just kind of, I think, 
highlights a bit of like why I think the game, the game is perfect in, in its like own way. It's just, it's functioning perfectly. And the show, it's like, he just gets like stabbed and then like falls off his horse. And that's the end of the episode. But that is that scene when you, when you're playing that you play that scene as Joel and it is super fucking intense. Like you fall off like the second balcony um, and you get like rebar, like stabbed through your stomach. And like, he's still, you get your gun out and you're still like firing at uh, those, those Raiders to save Ellie and then, you know, get on the horse and then you, you pass out and then it fades to like, it says like winter and then you're playing as Ellie. And that first time I played it, I was like, holy shit, like Joel is dead. Or like, you don't know yet. There's so many questions. Like you're playing as Ellie and you're like hunting a rabbit or a deer. And it's just like such an amazing way to like hold suspense and to like wrap it in with gameplay. Like you have not played as Ellie up until that point. And the game is called last of us. Cause like, you know, and I'm thinking like, Oh shit, like people die in this game. Joel is fucking dead. And now I'm just playing as Ellie and that's the second half of this game, man, that's crazy. But then, you know, it, it ends up, it's just the way the show did that was like pretty lame. And I know it's like a rerun for me, but there's, I would feel that no one at any point would have felt like, Oh, Joel died here. It's there. There, it was just not as suspenseful in any way. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I it's hard not to compare it. And, and so just to much be just to be clear, game. clear Zach, you haven't received any monetary compensation from Naughty Dog to <laughs> convince people no, to play I, the game. I, I mean, it's no, I, I wish, but uh, but it's it's <laughs> such a it's it's so good, like for for what it is. I have a hard time recommending the show if you're a gamer. It's just like, well, if you're a gamer, you can watch episode three and then you can play the game because that's really all <laughs> like everything in the game is is done better. And and you're because you're role playing it, your feelings are like wrapped up in in Joel's motivations and, you know, um, and his choices at the end. Whereas if you're just watching a show, you're you're much more detached. I have a question, Zach. Do do you can you make that choice at the end as um as Joel? Do you get to decide whether to save Ellie or not? No, no. That when or I does, say is like, that an automatic choice? No. no. When I say like gameplay choices, I'm talking about like the the types of things that are like not narrative based. There's no narrative choices. At least that I recall. Oh, that really? You can make oh, that's in, a bummer in, in the game. <laughs> yeah, it seems yeah, like there not, should be two really endings. That you it can does. Either way, I think that became maybe more popular in games after this. Like, I'm not sure, but I know, like, you could have killed one in the game. You could have killed one of the nurses with them as well. <laughs> um, so Joel didn't do that here. He had a little <laughs> restraint. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I love most about the Red Dead franchise and the Dragon Age franchise yes. from the jump from from the very first installments of those series, you are making tough choices and you have to live with the consequences of your choices. Yeah. And they're, they're and narrative that's... choices that like will remove characters from whole segments of the game. The Witcher's like that, too. Um, but yeah, mm, there's yeah, Naughty just... Dog tends to like there. It's so narrative. It's so about what has been written. There are choices, but it's like choices about that affect gameplay, pretty much gameplay only. Like, how do I conserve this ammo? How do I get out of this really tough, like tactical decisions um, regarding like enemies and and things like that? Yeah. Teresa, were you going to say something? Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, um, you know, so the first Red Dead game came out in 2011 and that also had a sudden character shift. You know, I don't know. Can you spoil a game that came out in 2011? But, you know, you're playing as one character for the, you know, all 100 plus hours of the game. And then it gets to a certain point and it switches to another. And it's really emotional. 
but it's only really for the epilogue. And then two years later, you get to this Last of Us where you're playing as Joel for the bulk of the game. And then you're playing as Ellie as this 14 year old girl. She can't hold the gun the same way. She doesn't have the same ammo, the same skills that you had gotten accustomed to. And you feel how vulnerable and young she is. And then you meet David. And I thought that was a brilliant way. And I think Naughty Dog did this really well. And Rockstar did it really well with Red Dead, particularly Red Dead 2, of figuring out a way to use gameplay to make players feel vulnerable and to put them in a a vulnerable person's shoes. And I think that's something interesting the game does and how that translated to The Last of Us as the show was trying to make you empathize in a in a different way and feel that vulnerability in a different way, like by giving Joel more overt moments of weakness, by showing you Ellie's mom and how she was the first person who died trying to protect her child. That actually reminds me, I had one other problem I, with the show I forgot to mention, which is the scene where um, <laughs> Ellie... Is this Best of Us? Best of Us for the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> the scene where Ellie, just when you're talking about her being vulnerable and stuff, the scene where Ellie finds out that uh, Sam, right, was the little kid, um, yeah. has been bitten. And she's just like, ah, I'm just going to smear some of my blood on there and go to sleep in the same room with you. And I'm sure it'll all be fine in the morning. I think that's kid logic. I kind of put that away as being like it's wishful, hopeful thinking of a child, you know, and I just I, I liked it. And like, it how could you fall asleep in the, in the room with someone that you knew had been bitten? I mean, I, I did know. think like, how did you fall asleep? Oh, God. That was... <laughs> but even just seeing a picture of Sam, like that that actor playing Sam, made me tear up because mm. I knew what would happen to Sam eventually. But that kid, um, I'm blanking on his name, Kevin Woodward, something like that. He was such a good actor. Oh my god! What but I mean, it, it also seemed it also seemed to me like I could imagine like if if this whole outbreak was new to you, that you would maybe be more inclined to have that sort of kid logic. But it, but Ellie's like grown up her whole life in this world, and it just seems like. Like any sort of um, idealism or um, naivete about about this um, cordyceps would have been drummed out of for a long time ago, it seems to me. Well, um, but mm. uh, Aaron, go ahead. Well, just I mean, first of all, her education is a product of of what Fedra wanted her to know about, and so you would yeah. assu- you would assume that that Fedra would be keen on teaching them um, how certain certain biological things work. But and and how cordyceps works, but but maybe not. But I guess the other thing I was going to say is I one of the things that I found a strength in the characterization of Ellie, um, because I have I, I mean I have worked with kids in very very difficult situations, and uh, and one of the things that strikes me often is how, it, it, and it gives you whiplash how they will be a cynical hardened adult in one moment and a small vulnerable child in the next. And you never know when that transformation is going to take place. And it, one of the things I think they did really well is is preserve that in Ellie, that she does have these moments where she's unmistakably a child, spliced in with those moments where she's mature beyond her years. And I thought that was both realistic and very dramatically impactful. Yeah. All right, cool. So we're, we're pretty much out of time. So I think we're going to have to start going, going into some final thoughts. So, uh, Teresa... Final thoughts on season one of The Last of Us. Oh, boy, this show really exceeded my very high expectations. I mean, I couldn't have been happier. I mean, I've played this game a bunch of times before. I knew all the big beats, and yet I looked forward to watching it every single week, seeing how they would add depth, how it would change, what they would keep, and just getting to talk to more people who never played the game about (laughs) what the hell I was talking about when I said Joel and Ellie are awesome, Gustavo Santolala and his music, Zach, I write to it too, that and the Red Dead soundtracks. I'm like, finally, people, there'll just be more people to play with and then, you know, see if they come join into the game. And if I'm sure hope Naughty Dog's got factions too coming (laughs) <laughs> because I think there's more people who will want to play. Um, I, you know, again, I really thought 
Bella Ramsey and Pedro Pascal did a wonderful job. I wish people would stop asking Pedro how he feels about being a daddy. It's really cringe and tired and demeaning. Um, and yeah, I'm really going to have to keep my mouth shut, I guess, for the next year and a half until hmm. season two comes along. Because I'm very curious how they're going to handle adapting the second game and its narrative structure, which is very different. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think this is like definitely a must watch show in my opinion. And it's such a good story. I mean, if you want to, like Zach saying, if you want to play the game um, instead of watching the show, if you're a gamer, fine. But it, you, I think you should ex- definitely, everyone should experience this story in some form or other because it just seems like, you know, it almost seems like a story that's so good that someone had to write it um, sooner or later. Like it almost exists, um, you know, in the ether or whatever and is just waiting for somebody to um to instantiate it you know but this this whole um particularly the climax and and joel's choice and ellie's choice is just so um yeah so so rich i mean we didn't even have you know we could have gone i think we could go on talking about all this stuff for a lot longer um oh man i yeah i had so many opinions on david yeah yeah unfortunately we only have uh nope i know but um yeah but there's there's a lot there's a lot more to say about the show. You should all go check out Teresa's reviews, uh, yeah, if you haven't, on tour.com. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, total two thumbs up for me. Uh, how about Zach? Final thoughts? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry I'm not as, like, <laughs> stoked about it. I do think it's a very good show, but um, it does feel like watching a rerun on mute for me. Um, just I the the game had a really special place in my heart i sound like i'm a sony sales rep here but uh but (laughs) play the game play the game you'll you'll enjoy it more and if you can't play the game then you can watch the show um and if you have played the game and you're not that interested at least watch episode three because it is standalone and you'll get plenty of you know thematic joy and uh just it's Episode three is, is very, very good. It's it's the highlight of the show for me. And Aaron, final thoughts. Um, well, I, that's a, a great segue into my final thought, which is I also agree that episode three is the standout episode. Um, and I think just uh, on a very sort of quick glimpse of the reactions on social media, a lot of people found that episode to be a standout, if not the standout of the series. And I really, it's it's so refreshing in this in this time when we've kind of been bludgeoned into um, instant gratification, narrative speed, where it's got to be action, 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 and get right to the action. And, you know, peripheral characters aren't given their due and those quiet moments aren't given their due because they, they are really what makes those dramatic moments work. Um, And so I would love to see more script writers and networks take a risk on putting out episodes like that. Um, that are more about heart and more about people um, and less about moving at breakneck speed from one slaughter fest to the next. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I got to have that um, uh, syncopation or whatever. There's those uh, uh, valleys and peaks uh, in the tension to, yeah, or else it all just kind of feels the same for sure. Um, All right, cool. But yeah, so everyone definitely, in my opinion, go check out this show for sure if you haven't seen it and definitely looking forward to season two. I mean, I guess um, I think I just saw that. Are they just talking about their ideas for season three or has season three been? I feel like I might have seen season three. It hasn't been officially. No, it hasn't. Season three hasn't been officially greenlit, but I could definitely see they have been talking. The second game is twice as long as the first. So I think, you know, more than one season makes sense yeah and i think this is definitely done well enough that it's probably going to go more than two seasons uh, definitely hope so um but we'll see and maybe we can all have you back to talk about season two uh, but for now we're going to wrap things up there so we've been speaking with aaron Lindsay, Teresa delucci and zach chapman so thanks everyone so much for joining us thank you thanks for having me thank you endure and survive <laughs> And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Aaron Lindsay, Teresa DeLucci, and Zach Chapman for joining us on the show. 
This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And remember to check out the new podcast, The Avram Davidson Universe, over at avramdavidson.com. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.